Hello, everyone. My name is Arden Hopkin. I have been involved with uh, Collar Lab for a long time, and each year I come, I meet new people and see people that I have known before and find pleasure in working with you to answer questions that you might have about how to use your voice more effectively. Um, I'm, there has been a format for the past four or five years in which there was a graded um, program beginning with uh, basic skills, intermediate skills, and advanced skills. And uh, the Color Lab determined that they wanted to go away from that format. So I come today not exactly sure where I should go with you folks in this time that we have together. And, and so I'm going to ask some questions of you and ask you to tell me what you hope to be able to get from this session that we have this, this morning. Joseph, can I just take the microphone, just pass it around? Um, what am I to do? Introduce myself and tell you what I expect to get? Just, uh, yes. My name is um, Joseph Dye, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Well, Marietta, Georgia, my badge sake. Uh, this is my first caller lap. You can see from my brown badge. And what I expect to get from this session here is confidence. I'm not a singer. I'm over 55, and here I am going to become a caller, and I'm going to have to do singing calls, which I do better than pattering calls, but that's what I expect to get is confidence in the mic in my hand and when I'm on the stage singing and some pretty lady wink at me, I don't forget where I'm at. I don't have an answer to that one. <laughs> my name is Bill Boyd and I guess what I'd like to get from this is last year we worked on some vowel sequences and I wanted to get those sequences written down so I could figure out where we are going to go with them and how I could practice them better on my own. Thank you, Bill. I'm Sharon Kopp from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I don't know what to expect. I just, I don't even know what I want. I, <laughs> I know when I do singing call, I have difficulty finding records that really, um, that I can sing along with. Uh, the men are way too low and the women are way too high and I don't harmonize well. So I don't know what I can do in between those things. But I have a session with you tomorrow. So hopefully you'll point me in the right direction then. Will you come back to this yes, like, yes, I will. So Good. All right. I'm Christine Nelson. I am a round dance cure, not a caller. Um, I am the voice. I have a really nice one. I'm having a little trouble with breath control because sometimes the things that we have to deliver a lot of information in a very short period of time, and I find I run out of breath. And it's only recently. It's it's kind it's kind of a newer phenomenon. It's just been over the last two years. That may have something to do with the scale. <laughs> Michael Walton Ford from Chicago. Um, I'm interested in vocal health, uh, how to not hurt myself calling. I also uh, teach for a living, so I use my voice a lot. I don't want to have problems down the road because I'm mistreating my voice now. Do you see any signs of mistreatment? Um, the only signs I see of mistreatment are sometimes... Um, my voice gets tired and I, I have a little bit of hoarseness. Um, some of that I know is stress and some of it, so some of it, is, but, but I want to know what I can do vocal technique. Should I be warming up before I dance? I don't. Uh, should, you know, what, what are the things that I can do to, 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 to make the most out of my voice and to keep it healthy, most importantly? Scott Bennett, Scott Bennett, Lawton, Oklahoma. I have the same type of uh, situation he has. I teach during the day and call at night. And vocal health is very important. As you can tell, I'm kind of hoarse right now. Um, and a little bit about harmony, things I'd like to learn a little bit about. Fran Waddell of New Jersey, and I'm in here for a little bit of everything, I think. I'd like to develop my voice I and learn how to use it properly, um, vocal health, and other things besides that. But that's what I'm focusing on right now. Thank you. Ron Kaptick from New Jersey. Well, I've been here a couple of times, and yes, looking for warm-up techniques, techniques for preserving the voice, dealing with the voice better. Arlen White, uh, Central California. Um, same thing. Uh, I, I'm here to learn vocal health, vocal technique, and uh, maybe even some harmony, if you can talk about that. Anna-Marie Cohen from France. I come because I have been once before to this session and it was very educative, especially the warm-up, what you should do before you sing. I sing a lot, uh, not just square dance calling, and it's very important to be able to sing well and prepare your voice. Thank you. 
My name is Avi Herndon. I am not a caller. I just came in to see what this was about. I We have a new caller that's coming up in our area, and I think he is taking voice lessons, but he needs encouragement, so maybe if I glean something from here, I can help give him support. In addition to doing wrong things. Oh, I was going to say, I, um, I can show you some things that you shouldn't do. I'm, I'm good at that, and I could offer you some suggestions on ways that you could hurt yourself and or offend people. <laughs> I do it on a regular basis. But I don't think you came for that purpose. And so let us begin. I, I want, There are three of you that identified that you've been here before whose faces I recognize. Are the rest of you new to this session? All right. Uh, those of you that are repeaters, it won't offend you if we go back over some basic material, would you? Be offended by that? Okay, so as I understand it, most of you are here because you want to preserve your voices. And you have uh, you use your voices all day long and into the evening, and you find yourselves from time to time becoming weary. And the evidence of your weariness is a raspiness in your speaking voice or a loss of strength and power in your voice. And a third possibility was that you lose some of your range, that you can't either sing as high as you used to or as low as you used to. And based upon the speaking voices that you two gentlemen gave, I would guess that the place that you are most vulnerable is at the lower part of your voice, that the low notes uh, escape you. Am I correct in that assumption? Maybe not. I never have a really low voice at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, would you like to come out of here with some strategies to get some low notes? Good. And they're, they, the same strategies that can be used to get low notes, increase your lower range, will also be useful for vocal health. So let me just start out with a general overview that in order for your voice to work, there have to be three elements present. One of them is a power source. That is the breath that you use. Your lungs and the breathing system preside, prevent, presents the power that generates the sound. Then you have a vibrator, and that vibrator is located right inside your throat, behind your Adam's apple. If you were to find your Adam's apple and then come down from there on the cartilage, maybe a quarter or a third of an inch downward, you would find the attachment place where your vocal folds are right behind that spot. And uh, those vocal folds are governed by a series of muscles that open them and close them. Inside the, the fabric of the vocal folds, there are some muscles that, when, the, when tensed, create greater power, and when relaxed, will make the tone sweeter. There are some other muscles that are used to take the vocal folds and, as pitch rises, to stretch them longer. As they stretch longer, they thin, and as the thinner vocal folds, the thinner, longer vocal folds vibrate, pitch rises. That's the system that our body uh, should be using most readily. From that point forward, there is uh, the enhancement of that sound, and that sound which comes out of your vocal folds doesn't sound any more sophisticated than uh, a simple duck call. It is just a, a... It's that kind of a sound. It's just a buzzing sound. But then as the raw sound is passed through the vocal tract, from the, the larynx upwards through the mouth and through the, the back of the mouth and so forth, certain of those buzzing sounds disappear. And other sounds are enhanced. And so the result is that I sound like me and you sound like you, and we all sound relatively human as compared to a trombone or a trumpet or a piano or a string bass uh, or any other kind of musical instrument. Our voice system is, by, by comparison, very small. The size of our vocal apparatus is about the same size as a piccolo in the orchestra. And yet we have the ability to produce sounds that range from as low as the trombones play to as almost as high as the piccolos play. Uh, it's a very unique instrument because of its flexibility. Yeah, most of the instruments are made out of something hard, brass, wood, uh, but but the vocal folds are made up of uh, fleshy fabric. The lungs are also very fleshy and flexible, and it's that flexibility that gives the wide contrast in uh, voice quality and also in pitch range. So in order to ensure good, proper vocal health, those various systems have to be brought into balance with each other. In order for the, you to understand one of the balances, you need to under, no, understand something about aerodynamics. There is a law in the field of aerodynamics called the Bernoulli Principle. The Bernoulli Principle simply states 
that air that's in motion creates low pressure or suction or a vacuum. Um, almost all of you flew on an airplane to arrive at this convention, and it was the Bernoulli principle that permitted that airplane to take off. You'll re remember that the airplane wing is concave on the top and flat on the bottom. So as it slices through the air, the air molecules that are above the wing have to travel greater distance and therefore have to travel faster in order to be back at the back wing at the same time as the air molecules passing below the wing that go undisturbed. That movement above the wing, that, that uh, traveling, speeding up column of air, creates low pressure. And when it reaches its uh, critical mass, when it hits that threshold, it will lift a heavy jet off of, the, off of the tarmac and permit an airplane to fly. And as all of you know, airplanes are very, very heavy objects. But the laws of physics, particularly related to aerodynamics, make it possible for an airplane to fly. It also is the same principle that's used to generate the, the sound that comes out of our throat. That can be tested, and I've done it several times. For those of you that have seen the demonstration before, forgive me. But for those of you that haven't, this will be instructive to you. I'm going to use two pieces of paper, which I brought with me. And as I... I'm going to have to do something creative with the microphone. I think I've got it. As I take those pieces of paper, were you to know nothing of the, the Bernoulli principle, you would assume that if I put the pieces of paper together and blew between them, it would blow the paper apart. Let's watch and see if that happens. Hmm. It does not do that. It doesn't blow them apart. If anything, it sets them to vibration. To, to drive that point homeward, if I part the papers and blow between them, you'll see them defy gravity because the power of the suction created by the flow of air between them. You see them drawn together by that principle. If I were to take a single piece of paper and just blow across the upward surface, you'd see what causes an airplane to fly. The movement across the upper face of the paper causes the, air, the paper to rise. So that principle uh, is really important in terms of vocal health. The purpose of my demonstration is to show you that with air in motion, vocal folds can be drawn together and can vibrate. And many of us don't understand that principle, and therefore we exercise too much muscular control in our throat, and that actually leads to vocal damage more than vocal health. So as I demonstrate one more time, if I just get a little stream of air moving, the papers approximate. If I increase the velocity of the breath that I have, you'll see that they not only come together, but they begin to vibrate. If we were to take that vibration and slow it down into very slow motion, you would see a, a fairly consistent behavior. The stream of air would draw the pieces of paper together until they meet. At the moment that they meet, for a, a very split second, no air would be able to pass through. And then, as the continuing breath from my lungs pushes on those molecules, the, the, the air hits a certain... Uh, thrust energy that parts the paper, and as the, paper, as the, the air moves, then it creates that, su that suction and brings the papers closed. So the, the papers are going through a, a vibration cycle of open and closed phase that's strictly governed by the speed of the air and the aerodynamics that are associated with that. They don't do anything. They just respond. Thank you very much. As a result, if you get the right velocity of air, you can move almost anything. You can understand that if these pieces of paper were uh, onion skin paper, very lightweight paper, it would take less air to put them into motion than if these were heavy paper, cardstock. And in the case of a hurricane, uh, you can actually get pieces of corrugated steel that will vibrate against each other because of the very power and velocity of the air that's involved. And, of course, corrugated steel is very uh, inflexible, very stiff. But the, the, that law of aerodynamics applies in many ways uh, across the world, but it applies very much in our business. I'd like to have you run a test with me so that you can begin to sense this in your own bodies. Please close your mouths and let your lips touch, and then open your lips so that they nearly touch but don't quite, so that they're just barely touching but not sealed. And then I'd like to ask you to just blow between your lips and see what happens. Nothing. <laughs> now, increase the velocity of your breath. You'll see that you started with your lips apart. And as you hit a certain velocity of, of breath, 
the lips began to vibrate. And that pattern is the same pattern that works in your vocal folds. However, your vocal folds are infinitely smaller than the volume of the flesh of your lips. Your lips may be two inches across from corner of mouth to corner of mouth, and they may be anywhere from a third to a half an inch or more thick. And so in terms of mass of flesh, that's a significant amount of flesh to move. By comparison, your vocal folds are, for you gentlemen, are the length of my fingernail. Look at your own thumbnail. About that long is how long your vocal folds are. You ladies can do the same. Of course, you can't, you can't count the part of fingernails that are there for effect. And just <laughs> In some cases, the cadavers that I've looked at, the, the vocal folds are about the size of your little fingernail. In other words, they're very, very short. And they're about two to five centimeters thick, meaning that they're very, very thin. You, you take a pencil lead, that's usually 0.7 millimeters uh, did I say centimeters? I meant to say, no, I'm sorry, I meant, to, I meant to say millimeters. So you take a thin pencil lead that is five millimeters in width, and you stack four of those on top of each other, and you have about the width of your vocal folds from top to bottom. So they're very small uh, things. However, they're not quite like your lips. Well, your lips do have some muscles, but the vocal folds have a number of forces that are work, at work upon them. Inside themselves, they can turn tense when they when you uh, become upset or when you're trying to uh, speak or sing loudly. They can become stiffer, more resistant to the airstream. Uh, inside the vocal folds and the inner edges of the vocal folds, there is a ligament that is nothing different than just a, a rubber band, a stretchy material that when stretched long will cause the vocal folds to thin out and pitch to rise. And when they relax, the inside edges of the vocal folds become soft and pliable. Uh, inside, at the center core of your vocal folds, is muscle. Th those muscles contract and make the vocal folds thick, thick and resistant and are responsible for the ranges uh, of the low range and also for a loud uh, projection. The uh, next layer is this ligament, and the, the superior layer is something called the epithelium or a mucous membrane, meaning that it's very viscous, it's very flu uh, flexible and fluid, and it slides easily on the inner, uh, the inner core of the vocal folds. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything in nature that I can compare it to quite, uh, but it is very flexible, and it is that surface that vibrates so freely and easily and slides back and forth. As a matter of fact, if we had a video camera, if I had a picture I could show you, you could look at vibrating vocal folds, and it, it appears for each time the vocal folds open and then close, at, at their closing phase, a ripple wave begins at the center edge of the vocal folds and gradually moves outward like dropping a, uh, a pebble in a pond. So the, the surface edges of the vocal folds are very moist, very flexible, and almost like jello. They're very flexible in their, uh, in their makeup, and that makes them very uh, easy to, to vibrate. So when you get into trouble, it is because either there is insufficient of air to cause the vocal folds to hit that threshold of efficiency, and that's a common uh, problem for singers. Or there's too much resistance in the throat, and therefore it takes a higher degree of pressure than would otherwise be necessary to, to make the vocal folds start to vibrate. Um, many people have a kind of a tight, strident speaking voice as a means of making their voice heard. The sonority of a human voice can vary from very tense and very tight and uh, to very loose and relaxed, and I will demonstrate some examples of those sounds. Here is a very loose, relaxed vocal fold with uh, not quite enough breath flowing, and you can hear that the tone becomes gentle and warm and inviting, but not very commanding. I, I now am using my psychologist's voice to soothe you and make you feel calm. And that isn't the voice that you want to use when you're trying to get dancers to obey you in a square. That's to, to invite disaster. It also doesn't project very well. However, with amplification, that sound can be very friendly and very mellow and very inviting. So it's a tone quality that callers might want to use on occasion when giving instruction. And even when everybody, you could see in the square that people are beginning nervous or anxious by just gently softening the quality of your tone, you can create a sense of uh, confidence and a reassurance for the dancers. Then, then if I take that very re loose, relaxed tone 
and increase the volume of the breath, of the frequency of my breath, do you hear what happens to the sound? It still has that same sort of mellow quality to it, but it now has much more of a command to it. Can you hear the difference? Here's this sound, and it's breathy and uh, not powerful. But as I increase, without changing the position of my throat, if I increase the breath stream, it moves to a point of great efficiency and clarity in the tone without sacrificing the warmth and the depth of the, in my voice. If I go farther and start to tighten up my vocal valve, the, the vocal folds, then you can hear that the tone becomes quite tight, kind of present, and a little bit irritating. And so we have developed in our lives the ability, when we want people to do what we say and do it right now, we use that irritating voice. It's a little tight and a little breath-starved, and they will obey you, but they won't like you in the process. And so ranging between that very tight and bright sound and that very loose, warm, mellow sound is the range where the best vocal health exists for achieving your objective of getting projection in your voice with an ease in its production. It has everything to do with the balance between the vocal folds, the resistance in the vocal folds, and the amount of air that's being delivered. And every person must find their own balance because each one of us is unique in the, the makeup of our body. We share in common the very various elements of our body, but we all are unique in terms of the direct application for ourselves. So I would like to have each one of you join me in an experiment. The first thing that I would like to ask you to do is to make a sound that I would characterize as being a whispering sound on pitch. What that means is that your vocal folds are vibrating just very gently. Here is an example of my voice with no pitch. I'm simply whispering to you. But now I just put a little bit of sound into it, and then my vocal folds are vibrating. And I can create a pitch by doing this. I can make that gentle sound right at that pitch level, or that pitch level, or that pitch level, or that pitch level. But when whispering, there is no pitch associated with it. So I want you to find, right about this range, the gentlest whispering sound that you can make on that pitch. And just sing, ah. Ah. Join me, if you will, please. Ah. Are you okay? You're all doing it so well I can't hear you. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to move around one by one. Okay, so very gently. Ah. Ah. Now, right off the bat, the first sound that came out of Joseph's mouth. Come and join us in the circle, if you will. Don't be shy. There are seats awaiting you. You'll hear that the first sound that came out of Joseph's mouth was a popping, uh, a kind of a percussive beginning. And so right from the very beginning, I know that Joseph's tendency is to use his vocal folds in a more constricted way than he will want to when he leaves here today. So, having said that, can you sigh? Can I? Sigh. Like, ah, ah, but easy, gentle. Ah, very good. Now take the top note of that, ah, and just sustain it. Ah, that's good. How gently can you do that? How quietly can you do that? Can you ask me to do some angles? No, that's right. Ah, there you go. There you go. So you, you saw that you were doing almost nothing next to nothing in terms of and still getting a little bitty sound that is not the sound that I want Joseph to leave the room with however that is the sound that I want him to begin with I'm going to get each one of you to do that excuse me you can see that at the attack moment it was a little bit more active than it should have been to be able to achieve it successfully very good good now, I'm saying good because you're, ex you're successful at doing the activity. That is not the sound that you want to sing with. <laughs> good. Would you describe what the feelings are in your throat? Uh, almost nothing's happening. Yes. One of the things that you b do become aware of is the movement of the air through your throat. Let's see if that's not true. There's a sense of breathiness to the sound. There's a movement of of air escaping, and that's different than normal. Would that be correct? Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry. 
As you're listening to each one, so far you're hearing most of the individuals start with more percussion at the beginning of their sound than they'll eventually have. Can you be quieter? That's very good. After the onset, which was just a little bit awkward because it was too tight in the throat. Good. Again, the same thing. As you first start, the muscles set themselves, and then you have to coax them into letting go. Yeah. Very good. Good. All of you can successfully do that. That is not where you want to end up. That is just to take some of the overt pressures out of your throat. And most of you found that at the moment that you went to make a sound, your throat reflexively tightened and you did something to make that sound happen. And then you had to pressurize it. Therein lies one of the challenges that gets in the way of good vocal health. Now, all of you, um, Joseph, you may not remember. It was long enough ago. You may not remember what that felt like. But each one of you, try to recreate that in your mind's eye in a moment. I would like to ask you to hold your hands up in front of you with your finger extended and imagine that you had a child's pinwheel on the top of your finger. I would like to ask you to blow on that pinwheel and make the pinwheel, your, the imaginary pinwheel, move slowly. You can feel what your body does. It just has a very gentle stream of breath. Now, imagine, take the imaginary pinwheel and make it move more quickly. You see what your body does to intensify the airstream and make you can feel the air as it moves across the tip of your finger that it's moving with greater velocity. Now make the pinwheel move very fast. Remember that image as we now take that sound that you presented that was very gentle. I'm going to demonstrate. What I'm going to do, here's the first sound, the very gentle, free, sighing, untense sound in my throat. Now watch what happens. Here's the pinwheel, the imaginary pinwheel, moving slowly. <clears throat> Here is it moving faster. Here is it moving faster yet. And here is it moving at fast speed. And so what happens is without changing anything in my throat from that sighing position, which I started with, and by finding the point at which my breath was at the right velocity to cause my vocal folds to close spontaneously and begin to vibrate, I found a, a, a comfortable, relaxing position from which I could make a, a singing tone. Would all of you try that? Here, we're going to start on this pitch. So start with a sighing sound. Place the imaginary pinwheel in front of your voice, in, your, in front of your mouth. Make the air that's coming out represent the pinwheel moving slowly. And what you can hear is a quietude, an easiness, but also um, a breathiness. There's a diffusion in the sound. Now, increase the velocity just in the same way that you did it a minute ago, but leave your throat in that sighing position. Keep going. Okay, now make it more faster. You can hear what's happening to the quality of the, of the voices in the room. It is becoming greater volume, greater uh, projectability, but not yet to that threshold. Now make it move quickly. Okay, I'm going to turn over to Joseph, and I want to have you just describe what that feels like compared to what you usually do. Um, it's, I'm having more control I mean, uh, when projecting my voice. I have a tendency of not talking loud enough and, and so finding that range. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because you actually feel as if you're doing less and getting more. And that is indeed exactly what you want to have happen when you sing. Would someone suggest to me a tune that we might all know and that we might sing together? We've got Anna Marie here from France, and so I'm not sure if we find any. Can we sing Alouette? That's actually. Con... Row, row, row your boat. Okay, do you know that in French? 
All right. Well, you can, but you know the name. <laughs> okay. All right. So you can see. All right. We can, should we try Frere Jaca? Or if you don't know it, it's row, row, row the boat. First of all, find that sighing place. We're going to start right there. Ah. And you just do that by changing the velocity of the speed of your breath, not by tensing up in your throat. Does anybody find that puzzling? Yes, you do. You find that's puzzling, how that can happen? Just a moment. Just a minute. I'm trying, when I'm trying for that, I get raspy. Initially, that's true. Let's, let's watch you through that whole cycle. Start uh, okay. now you, you simply ran out of breath, didn't you? So take a new breath and start where you left off. Uh, oh, that's different. It is, it is. Yeah, now there's, that which you just did was very effective to improving the point, but there's more control that you can have in your pitch. You noticed that as you increased your velocity, your pitch went up. That meant that your vocal folds were entirely passive, and they shouldn't be entirely so. You still want to be able to control what pitch you sing. We're going to test that right now. So here we go. We're going to start right about here. That about there. Here's the pitch. Make it move. And each one of you will know when you've hit that point of efficiency because it will move from a breathy, diffused quality to a clear tone and from a clear tone to a rich tone all at once. You can hear it happen in my voice. Ah, there's clear. Ah, there's rich. And it's just a matter of breath speed. So here we go. Can you find it? Frank, go. Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques, dormez-vous, dormez-vous. Dormez dormez la matine, ne la matine, ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong. It's been too many years since I did it in French. Now, row, row, row your boat, please. Same thing, same pitches, go. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Talk to me about what your perceptions are. Show your hands so I can get you on microphone. What do you perceive happening with your own voices? Just a minute. It's open across my throat, which is very, very unusual. Usually I'm tight. I feel it open. Does anyone else feel something similar to that? She describes it as being open or, or wide in the throat. I felt I was using lower notes, which I have difficulty doing usually. It was a little bit easier. It felt lower, didn't it? It actually wasn't. We sang right in the middle range, but nevertheless, it felt very relaxed, like you usually associate with low notes. High notes are tenser, low notes are more relaxed, generally speaking. I found it was difficult to reach the high notes. I, I cheated you just a little bit. I put you into a higher range than I ought to have done for the very first one. You're shaking your head, too. And I was like, you're singing along fine, and then all of a sudden, the high notes come, and you go, ah, and your voice freezes up, as it has a tendency to do. So we're going to do that same thing over again, a little bit lower in pitch. Ready? We'll start right about there. You're going to find that threshold of efficiency. It's a point of efficiency, or what I call the threshold of your breath. Beyond that point, your voice will work efficiently. Below that point, one of two negative things will happen. When you're below the point of efficiency, your breath, your voice will either turn breathy because there isn't enough suction to cause your vocal folds to close all the way, and therefore breath leaks out and is, is a part of the tone uh, that's known as white noise. So you sing, and in the background you have, ah, that's white noise. And so it's just breath leakage. That's a signal that you don't, you have not fit, hit that point of efficiency. However, if you don't want that white noise in your voice, many singers will tighten up their vocal folds to make do with the quantity of breath that's available to them. And so I'm suspecting that you two gentlemen share that same characteristic, that you don't have sufficient breath, so you tighten up in your throat to make do with what you have. And so you get a clear tone, not a breathy tone, but it's very tight. And as, the, as that tightness goes across the day and into the evening, your vocal folds gradually grate on each other and you get hoarse. Okay, so if you can find that point of efficiency, you will reduce the amount of friction in your throat and increase the amount of volume in your throat. So having said that, let's answer that question. 
where you, you described the clear tone and the rich tone, which one are we aiming for here? I think that you want to um, at least have clear tone because in the, uh, in the kind of singing that you will do, you're interested in clarity but not richness or opulence of sound. There are some callers that you listen to that have incredibly rich voices and they're very inviting at the same time that they're clear. And, and so they, they have a certain attractive quality, and they are the ones that go that step beyond. It does you no harm to go that step beyond, but the minimum would be to find that point of efficiency. Okay, so here we go again. I'm going to pitch it a little lower for those of you that are cowardly. So we're going to see row, row, right about there. Find that point of efficiency. Go. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Okay, raise your hands if you have any comments to make before we move on. Anybody have any observations that they'd like to make or any questions to ask at this point? No one has raised their hands to say, I fear that with using this much breath, I'm going to run out of breath. I'm surprised nobody's raised that question. Okay, do you have that anxiety? Okay, so now, in order to be able to not run out of breath and have your breath last as long as it should, you have to enter into a purposeful strategy to not allow your breath to escape from you. Would all of you stand up beside your chairs? I'm going to introduce to you a breathing exercise. It's actually very fun, uh, but it'll ma it may make you feel a little silly in this therapy session. I'll demonstrate it to you and then ask for you to join with me in it. The exercise is simply to take your hand, right or left hand, it ma doesn't matter, and as you move the hand upward and away from yourself in an arcing motion, you inhale. So this represents what should be going on in the inside of your body. I'll make noise through the microphone so you can hear what I'm doing, but you should do it silently. And then at the exhalation cycle, it stops right about the height of your, your uh, clavicles, right at your, your top of your chest. Then your hand rotates over and pushes downward, close to your body, to the bottom, which is right down at the bottom of your torso. So it looks something like this. What you're learning to do is to externalize the motion of your breath. Can you all sense the natural rhythm? You get a little marriated with too much oxygen. You can see that it just your bottom ha your body has a rhythm. It's like the, the flow of the tides, in, out, in, out, and it's a very soothing and calming cadence. And and one of those things that you could do if you get a little bit hyperactive in a dance, and when you get a, a break, you could just walk off in a corner and do about six or seven of those things, and that would help you to find your your breath again. So you can see that that's uh, that's pretty demonstrative of what we ought to do when we breathe. As, as you do that, I'm watching you out of the corners of my eye, and it appears that you're breathing healthily and appropriately. However, when you start to sing, something changes, and that is that the amount of time that it takes to exhale becomes much longer, and the amount of time permitted to you to inhale is much shorter. So it becomes a lopsided arc. So we sing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. You see that cycle? Would you join with me? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And yet the pattern is that we don't take that uh, breath that often. Therefore, the movement of our hand needs to slow down to mirror the movement of the breath. I'll demonstrate it. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And the simple process of m metering my hand caused me to not use my breath so, uh, so much at the beginning. Our body has a tendency, when we breathe, to just take a breath and relax. And take a breath and relax. Take a breath and relax. And as we, as we relax, the breath exits our body. But now we have to purposefully control the amount of exit so that it can last as long as we need it to. Now, you'll see this in your own hands. You'll start off, and the idea is that when you start singing, your hand moves at the speed that it needs to to be able to 
get all the way through the end of the phrase. It's interesting. No one in this room ever runs out of breath while they're talking. And yet you never purposely take a breath and say, I'm going to talk for the next six seconds, so I have to take a big breath. We just sort of naturally do it. There's a pattern built into our brain that says, I have a big, long sentence, so I'm going to make it last as long as it needs to last to get all the way to the end. And then if I have an addendum to put on the end, there'll still be a little bit left so that I can keep talking as long as I need to to get to the end of the idea. You know, and we just, we just, we can feel that our body's doing a little extra work, but we never, nobody ever runs out of breath when they're talking. I've never yet met a person that does that. So somewhere that gets calibrated in our brain. And so that same pattern can be true for our singing. Will you join with me? Now we're going to put two phrases together. Go. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And you'll notice that you had no difficulty going from the beginning of that phrase to the end of that phrase. Did you? Right at the bottom. Right at the bottom, you could say. You could say. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So you, there's a little practice, practice that goes with this, isn't there? So the idea is really very simple. It, you just make your breath start and keep it in motion all the way to the end of the phrase. And where most of us have our trouble is that we are very generous with the flow of our breath at the beginning, and then we squeeze at the end. And instead, you want to just keep it at a steady stream all the way through. You can demonstrate this for yourselves. Do this for me. Now, right about there, you'll say your body doesn't want to keep the air flowing. Keep it going. Keep it going. And then take a new one. And... You see the process that you go through? You gradually teach yourself to, to control the exit of your breath. It's a very easy external thing to do. Would this be something good to practice with, your, with the singing calls that we do? As, as we're singing, oops, excuse me, and move our hands as we're practicing? I think that would be an excellent idea when you're at home practicing. Might not be a good idea at the dance. <laughs> yes. Uh, since most of our music is all metered the same, the singing calls, you know, Four four time. So I, I'm thinking eight beats or sixteen beats is the breath, which most likely, and that would be a great tool. Is just to practice the breathing, uh, breathing with the song. You know, do the phrase of the song and boom. I think you're absolutely right, and you can measure yourself by how quickly your hand moves down through your body. If you'll find you'll find yourself just watching in the mirror that you'll go start and then your your hand will get here and it'll just stop and you won't even realize that it's stopped. But so has your breath along the way. Or you get down to here, and it stops. You know, you, the hand just quits moving. But if it keeps moving through, you'll find that your body will respond. So this external little activity will cause you not to, cause, to, to freeze your breath, but to keep the breath moving all the way through. Um, Joseph, can I get you to hold the microphone just for a second? I can, I'm sorry, uh, Scott? I'm going to do a demonstration with Scott. Would you put your hand up against mine and put them back at your shoulders? All the way back by your shoulders, okay? Now push over to my shoulders. This is, the, this is a metaphor for the breathing. Now back and all the way through. Good. Now, one of the interesting things is, I do it gently, and you'll notice that I'm meeting you with about the same resistance, right? Now do it a little bit more vigorously. And you'll notice I'm giving you more resistance, but you still win. Now more vigorously yet. You see what's happening? You're seeing what's happening to his arms? I've got him at a disadvantage on purpose. You notice that I never put myself in that place. I'm always in a <laughs> position of strength. But you could feel your, your muscles trembling. And that's exactly what happens with us when, when we can, we're working too hard and we're not getting any result. Now, if Scott and I were to continue that game over, over the course of several days and weeks, his upper body strength would build and he'd have the capacity to work with greater energy. So it's that tool that Scott and I were just demonstrating that is the way that you gradually build power into your voice. You first find equilibrium or balance, and then as you start to sing with greater power, it's that same sort of activity. One of the things that Scott didn't do that I expected him to do was to push toward me and stop about two-thirds of the way over toward my shoulders. And that's usually what most people do. They'll push, and they'll get about halfway across, and they'll stop. And I have to coax them to finish the gesture. And it's that very behavior that we're talking about in terms of your breath. It's making sure that you finish it all the way through. You you will, you will not turn inside out. You will not find yourself squeezing for breath. You'll just find yourself able to go because you maintain a sense of equilibrium. 
That's right. And that is one of the tools that voice teachers use to get people to sing with greater vigor is that as they have to engage their body in muscular activity, the whole abdominal wall has to firm itself, and it's the abdominal wall that's responsible for getting the air to leave. Go ahead and have a seat. That may not be all the answer that you want, but I'm sorry. Would you let me just look at your Bob? As Bob pointed out, your dances follow in very steady sequences, and they are all about the same tempo. They're a, they're a brisk walking tempo most of the time. So that you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Somebody got a watch? Time how many seconds that is. It's about five or six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Isn't that about six seconds or so? Between four and so. As you're going along, most human beings need no training of any kind to be able to sing four seconds to six seconds in length. There's just a natural amount of breath that's in our bodies. But from six seconds up to a ten seconds, you have to be very purposeful with this this hand exercise that I showed you or something else to, to cause your breath to continue to flow from beginning to end more steadily throughout the process. Under, and then if you're going to go beyond ten seconds, you really have to be purposeful, and there's another strategy where you actually resist the tendency to let your air go away. And there are individuals who can, can sing upwards of 25 to 30 seconds, uh, 25 or 30 second phrase. And that's way beyond what you have to. That's like taking the whole first set of the song and going without any breath from beginning to end of it. That's way beyond the capacity that you need. But you can certainly see that if you had the capacity to be able to expel your breath steadily for 10 to 12 seconds, that would give you double whatever you'd ever need and so therefore would engender in you a certain degree of confidence that you were never going to run out of breath because you had the mechanical skills to do more than what was required of you. <clears throat> yes, Bob. It also comes in handy on the very last tag where it has an extended portion of the, the music. And sometimes you want to hit that special sequence. That's correct. You have an extension at the end, and it also has a bearing on when you want to sing with greater force because it takes more breath to cause that extra force to happen. Is everybody following along okay so far? Does this seem overly... Let me know if you, this seems overly simplistic. So what we've just done is to create an environment where you can sing for extended periods of time uh, without vocal exhaustion because you're actually reducing the amount of resistance of muscle control in your throat and substituting it for flow of breath. How do you get from where you are now to where you would like to be? Very persistently and very gently. Don't be in a big hurry. You will not walk out tonight and start calling a dance and have a new technique because those habits will be de are deeply ingrained in you, and if the, as they stay ingrained, it will take a while for those to transition. You have to purposely say, gentle, 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 open in my throat, and vigorous, fast-flowing breath. It is not the volume of breath that you send. It is the velocity of the breath that triggers it. So it doesn't have to be a big, fast, fat stream of breath, but it does have to move quickly. Remind yourselves again. Use the pinwheel. Here's slow breath. Here's faster breath. Here's really fast breath. And try to identify what it feels like for your body to do that. And then combine those things together. What we have just done constitutes about 80% of all that you need to know about singing. And yet, since so very few people talk about this in the way that I'm talking about it, it goes unattended. Now, there are other things that you do want to talk about that constitute that remaining 20%, having to do with extending your range upwards or extending your range downward. That's certainly important. But most of you know that within, uh, if, if you call a dance, how many, how many singing tips will you have in a three-hour dance? Fifteen? Eight or nine? Nine singing tips. So, and they last somewhere in the neighborhoods of six minutes apiece or so, wouldn't you say? Let's say, let's say four minutes tops. Okay, four times nine is 36 minutes. That's, an, that's a half an hour, slightly more than a half an hour of singing. Phew, that's easy. As long as you follow the principles that I'm talking about, you'll find yourself at the end of the night not vocally tired if you'll follow these principles. If you don't, 15 minutes in, 20 minutes in, 
you're already starting to feel a little weary. And the last 40 minutes of the dance, it's just like pulling teeth. It's really hard to keep yourself going. Because these muscles that are in your throat are very small, fine-tuned muscles. They're not intended for overactivity. They're intended for fine work. Um, the muscles that you have in your fingers are not as strong as the muscles that you have in your arms, nor are they as strong as the muscles that you have in your legs, because they're designed for fine work, not for heavy lifting kinds of things. So therefore, the, you need to be respectful of the muscles that are in your throat, that are in your larynx. They're for fine-tuned activities, not for heavy-duty activities. So be gentle upon them. But these muscles of breath, those are designed for vigorous work and can work for long stretches of time without weariness. Who would like to now talk about range? Okay, good. One of the things that you'll discover is that as soon as your vocal folds hit relaxation point, when they're no longer stiff and resistant, you will your range will extend upwards and your range will extep, extend downwards. I'd like to teach you a skill. It's called, uh, in German, the Freitone or the free tone. It's just a rumbling tone in your throat. I'll demonstrate it. Will you do that with me? You'll notice that my tone has no pitch to it at all. It's just a rattle. Uh, is there anybody having a difficult time producing that fry tone? Uh, uh, somewhere over here I'm hearing it. And there was a hand over here. Okay, can I get you to be a guinea pig for just a second? I have to check your name. Sharon, Sharon thank you. Okay, so what you do is you start off with uh, a generous flow of breath, and then you let your voice drop to its lowest range and let it be at its most relaxed place. I'm going to have to sneak up on Sharon because she's never gone down into that range before. She doesn't know this particular modality in her voice. Will you purse your lips like you were going to holding a straw in your mouth? Or like you were going to kiss a monkey? Really small lips, right? So you go, can you blow through it? Can you vo voice that sound? Now, I want you to just glide down as low as you can and then below. You'll watch me do it once and then you imitate me. Your fright tone will not be as low as mine will because I'm a man and you're a woman. She has, uh, she has a modality that she has never found before. I'll have to scratch my head a little bit to see if I can trick you into that place. Go ahead and have a seat, Sharon. Did you? Yeah. And it, it's actually like doing something wrong, you know, like, ooh, sorry, you know, <laughs> when in actual fact it's just a new, new, new modality. Bob, would you come up and give it a try? Off the, off, out of my right ear, I heard somebody who wasn't there. there. Was, that was me. Oh, 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 ooh. Ooh. But purse your lips as if you're going to blow through a straw. There, there you are. That's it. That's it. But the but the characteristic is that it has no pitch associated with it. That's the part I'm, I'm not trying to figure. You're talking about how much lower it was, and then you're telling me there's no pitch. Yeah. Well, let, let me demonstrate. Can you tell what pitch I'm on here? Ah, uh, that's easy to tell the pitch. Uh, there's no pitch associated with that. However, there are some individuals over in Tibet who practice this kind of tonal production and can tune it. And there are men who sing in Russian choirs who get down into that rattling sound and can, can tune it within a short range. And they become like the, the double stop on an organ, you know, the big 32 or 64 foot pipes that are on organs that make them rumble. Oh, that's the same sort of principle. Yes, it is. Uh huh. So, why do you not, why do you need to know about that tritone? The reason that it's useful to you is because it is the position at which your larynx is at its most relaxed position. And it's also the place where your vocal folds are at their most relaxed place. So for those of you that use their voices vis busily throughout the course of the day and are looking for a way to slough off the tension that comes into your voice over the course of the day, periodically going into your teacher's rooms or going apart and just doing a fry tone 
would be useful to you. Those of you that are calling a dance, um, each time you take a break, how often do you take a break? Three, four times in the course of an evening? All right. Every time you go do that, you just get yourself apart and for about 20 seconds do a fry tone. Yes, I, how to produce it? Yes. yes. You simply let your voice be at its most relaxed. It will settle into a, a, a quietude, both in terms of the height of your larynx and your throat, and also in, tune, in, in terms of the relaxation in the vocal folds themselves. Sharon, for example, couldn't conceive of the notion that her vocal folds could be more relaxed. You would wish to have lower notes than you have. And so Sharon's strategy, as she was demonstrating a moment ago, was to press her voice when she gets low, and that absolutely cuts it off and doesn't allow it to happen. I can imitate what you are doing by saying, ah, 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 and it just won't go any lower because it's too tense. But if I go, that's right. But if I go, ah, ah, and there it is. So that, that means if you were able to find that tune, that, uh, that tone is a way to preserve relaxation in your throat. It's also a way to start discovering a wider range for you to sing in. Let me demonstrate. I'm going to start with a, a fry tone, and then I'm going to turn it over into a real singing tone. You'll want to listen carefully to see if the transition is handled smoothly or bumpily. And the, the desire is to get it to blend right straight across from that relaxed fry tone to an actual sung pitch. <clears throat> uh, uh, creates a very relaxed low pitch. Uh, 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 you can see it's right in between there. That's the lowest pitch that I sing. You know, and from day to day, that'll vary just like it will with everybody. Everybody has built into them a certain boundary. We most of the time live well within those boundaries and don't really ex explore all that's available to us. But there are upper extremes and lower extremes beyond which we can't go, and that varies from person to person. But if I establish that pitch, uh, uh, now I'm just going to build a scale. That's about as high as I can go. Uh, I lied. Uh, I can't quite make that other range. But that all starts from that relaxed place. And that's kind of a novel notion. That instead of going, uh, I just move. Uh, 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 and they all emanate from that position in my throat that grew up through the fry tone, the, the relaxed place. So, <laughs> what are we going to do about that? Somebody want to be a guinea pig? Come on up. Okay, so first what we're going to do is get you to find the fry tone. Uh, let, let that blend across to whatever comfortable low note, doesn't have to be particularly low, that you can produce. Uh, if you were going to really bring that to that point of efficiency, you'd have a little ways to go, wouldn't you? Because it's still a little breathy. Can you hear the diffusion in the tone? Uh, You'll notice that at the moment that it started to turn to a pitch, your muscles in your throat tightened. Did you sense that? I, I heard something happen. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, okay, now using that fry tone... Go to that pitch. Uh, I didn't make that pitch. Did I? What pitch? Uh, so you're right there. Join with me. Yeah, 
that went turn fault settled, but he went all the way through uh, an octave and a half of range, which, by the way, is about as high as you ever need to go to be able to do any kind of singing call. In order to get uh, sort of have free range wherever you want to go with any any singing call, you need about two octaves of range because some of the men who record the records have higher voices and sing higher, and some have had lower voices. And by the time you intermingle them together, you end up with uh, the need for about two octaves worth of range if you're going to sing any kind of call that you want to. But for most of you, having a range of an octave and a half is going to be just all you need. Uh, did that surprise you? Um, it surprised me that going from the fry tongue all the way up was as comfortable as it was. It's, it's very deceptive, isn't it? It's not as you expected it at all. And so part of the game that I wanted to show by that little demonstration was that as you achieve relaxation in your vocal folds, you achieve greater access to your low range and you achieve a greater access to your high range than you otherwise would have, all as a byproduct of just maintaining relatively relaxed vocal folds instead of hyperactive vocal folds. Okay, Michael, thank you. Yes? Your, your discussion on posture, would you go over that one more time? I'd be happy to. How am I doing on time? Because we didn't got to, we haven't talked about vowels yet. Well, am I over? Is it past noon? Okay. It's six minutes to 12? So we're good, right? I didn't think I was. I didn't think I was that far off. All right. Okay. All right. So, so let me let me talk about two different things. We got two different things that we want to talk about. Because Bill said he wanted to talk. It is Bill, right? Bill wanted to talk about how to tune vowels. And since when you sing, you depend upon vowels to carry the sound of your voice. Consonants interrupt the flow, but vowels carry it. If you can get your vowels to be more um, uniform, you'll find your singing to be more uh, easier to produce. I'm going to start off very quickly going through the patterns, and we're going to start with the vowel that gives most Americans the greatest fit. It's actually a wonderful French vowel. So the E, it's the vowel E, as in C or weenie or something like that. You know, it's that vowel. So would you please say cheese? Elongate the E. Cheese. So that you can see what your tongue is doing while you produce it. Cheese. If you produce that the way I produce it, you'll find that your tongue thickens, draws back a little bit, and it spreads out between your molars. Is that... I see people nodding their heads. Anna Marie, probably not. Probably not for you. So there, you have that pattern to begin with. The second one is to say the word pizza. Pizza. <laughs> Wow. Da -da -dum, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, bum -bum. I was ready to take off. And... Okay, so say, if you will, pizza. Pizza. Now elongate the E. Pizza. Do you notice that your tongue is in a different position when you say pizza than when you say cheese? That when you say cheese, your tongue thickens. That's the traditional American E vowel. It's a very unfriendly singing vowel because it clogs your throat. It tightens the base of your tongue. Now say pizza again. Pizza. You'll notice that the tongue no longer draws back on your molars. It arches slightly forward in your mouth, and it creates a kind of a channel across the roof of your mouth where the E vowel has a chance to exit. Listen to the difference in the sonorities. Cheese. Can you hear the buzziness in that sound? Pizza. It's a different resonance in the vowel. That pizza vowel, that, that E vowel, is very, very um, useful for singing, and cheese is not. So having found that position, would you again say pizza to get together? Pizza. Okay, so that's the E that we're going to build off of. Now, each one of you, drop your mouth when we're on the E as far open as you can without changing the meaning of the vowel. I'll demonstrate. If I say P, hey, that's no longer an, an E vowel because I've, I've gone where I can't create that sound. So... If I can go P, it's still an E vowel, but it's, you hear what happens to the sonority? P, it's just a little bit, your jaw is just a little bit slack, but you're still making an E vowel, and that will make the vowel more pleasant to hear. I would like to have you then alternate that vowel quickly, back and forth, between a U vowel in the following way. P, go. P, and stop on the U. Whoops. <laughs> well, 
you stop too quickly. What I want you to do before you stop is you'll discover that as you alternate those vowels quickly, they will equalize. And what I mean by equalization is that you no longer feel the E in the front of your mouth and the U in the back of your mouth, but as you go quickly back them, back and forth, they centralize. And you can still hear the E sonority, you can still hear the U sonority, but you don't feel the movement in your mouth. And that's, it's a very personal way of identifying that, uh, that uh, arrangement. Would you join me? And then stop on the U. <laughs> I want you to do it five times and stop on the U. Go. Now let me ask you, does that feel like a U vowel? No, it is a U vowel, but it's not your traditional way to form the U vowel. To prove that point, now say U. U. Feel it goes through the back of your mouth, and when you go U, it sort of stays in the front of your mouth. The vibrations stay in the front. This is an activity to discipline your tongue. Most Americans, American English is one of the most guttural languages in the world. And when you hear other individuals from other countries, children particularly, when they're trying to imitate English, they, they do it by saying, <laughs> that's what English sounds like to, to many people in other languages. And so we're not aware of it because we live with it every day. But nevertheless, our tongue is very much involved in the back of our throat when we produce our vowels. The, the tightness of the tongue in the back of the throat becomes an obstacle to successful singing. So would you join me one more time to try to equalize E and U? Good. And one of the nice things about that is that the U no longer is swallowed. It projects outward and therefore is a, a uniform quality. The next vowel that I'd like to have you join with that E is an A vowel. Would you simply say, yeah, 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 go, yeah, 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 and stop on the A? Does that, as you come across from that equalizing thing, does that feel like an A? Try it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now see your normal A. A. You can feel your tongue moving backwards, and it's, it moves back on your molars. Now go, yeah, 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 yeah. And it sort of sits on the hard palate, buzzes on your nose a little bit. All we're doing is retraining your tongue to sit in a slightly different position as it forms those vowels. And as it sits in that new position, it does not block up your throat. As it's, if it, you allow it to sit in the back of your mouth and block up your throat, you create turbulence in the back of your throat. And in the process, you make it more challenging and more difficult to sing. You all know what it feels like to walk into a stiff headwind. It takes extra effort to get forward. When you create turbulence in your mouth by putting your tongue in the wrong place, it creates a problem with that very turbulence that I was talking about. Now, having found that A, yeah, 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 now go A, O, 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 A, A, O, A, O, A, O, A, and stop on the O. And there again, you find that the O is different than normal speaking O. <clears throat> the last one that you need to equalize, and then if you if you go, they all sit in the same place. You're getting all of the vowels, but the back of your throat is infinitely quiet by comparison. Now simply say ya 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 ya, ya 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 ya, and notice that that ah vowel does not feel like a normal ah speaking vowel. Ya ya. The normal ah, see, do ya, 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 now sing your normal ah, ah, see how it sits back in your throat more? That's all your tongue's doing. Your tongue is the culprit. The Apostle Paul in the Bible said that the tongue is an unruly member, and it really proves out when you're trying to sing. Say wa, 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 ya, 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 same vowel, right? You arrive in the same place. So that's a, that's a little routine that you can use to try to equalize your vowels so that you don't have to work so hard in your mouth. So if we were to take um, Frère Jacques and sing it, but without the words, alternating vowels, it would be like this. And I'd like to have you try that. Try it. And you felt 
that there wasn't very much movement in your mouth. Some of you would have drawn attention to the fact that as you start to go up the scale, hey, oh, hey, that doesn't sit where you normally think your voice is supposed to sit. Did anybody sense that? As you moved up into the higher notes of the no, of the song, did the vibrations sit in a different place than when you normally expect them to? Try it with me, and, and then we'll have to stop. Now stop. Is that in a different place than you normally experience it? Now sing your normal language. Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, dormez-vous, dormez-vous. You see, it's in a different place, isn't it? And it is in a different place because your tongue is in a different place. And it's in a different place because you're singing habitual vowels rather than these equalized singing vowels. How do you make application of this? When you are learning to put calls into your voice, don't sing the words straight off. Choose a vowel combination, either E and U, or O and A, or E and A, or U and O, or O and A, or A and A. They're, they're just, I'm just taking the five cardinal vowels and putting them in an organized pattern. So if you're learning that singing vowel and you're trying to work, singing call and you're trying to work the tune into your voice, just equalize your vowels and sing the tune until you get it learned. Having felt that pattern, then turn right back around having felt that pattern, and sing it, trying to imitate what you've just done with the equalized vowels. Little by little, your voice will become more resonant, it will speak out into the room with greater ease, and your singing will be less wearisome to yourself <laughs> and also to the people that listen to you. So we've talked a little bit about uh, equalizing of vowels. we talked a little bit about a strategy for range extension. We've talked a little bit about, a lot, about the, the fundamental way of making a healthy singing tone and the only thing that we have not discussed is how do you warm up your voice. There is a very quick warm-up that you can use. Will you all purse your lips as if you were going to uh, drink out of a straw? Or would you say, uh, Anna Marie, will you say we? Oui? We? Oui? See, see, the little when she begins the little W beginning, it has a fricative quality to it. it it's not ooh, but we, oui, because it's very tightly pursed in the front of the mouth. That's the perfect example of that sound that I'd like to have you use. Then, choose that in a low range and simply rev your engines. I'll demonstrate. Like you're trying to get a car to start. Using that very same energy, raise the pitch. Some of you will feel that your throat rise. Don't do it. Keep in the same place. Now go to the high range. You make sure that the vocal folds are passive. That's done by the little the little W thing. Boy, I need time to explain that, so I just won't. Then, having done that, you go. Try it. There are just two rules that govern this little exercise. As you go up the scale, you may not tighten your ribs. They have to stay in the very same pressure that they started with. So as you go up, you'll hit halfway, and then all of a sudden your ribs will want to squeeze in and you'll want to apply greater pressure. Don't do it. Make your voice figure out a way to rise pitch without increasing pressure. I'll demonstrate again. Right there would be where you'd change. Just don't allow your, your breath to compress. Try it. In that little three minutes, you've done everything you need to do to warm up your voice. You may not believe it, but you have. You've engaged your breath properly. You've engaged your vocal folds in that passive, thresholdy kind of way. You've taken that through an entire range, high and low, You've touched every note that you're going to sing and then some, and every note that you're going to sing and then some. Now, if you're not really secure about that and you really don't believe me, then you'll do this. And you see what I'm doing. I'm just setting up the pattern and then just opening my mouth up and letting come out what it'll be. And 
I just found a way to get my voice flexible, the vocal folds not tight, the air flowing adequately, and with no pressure. And that can be done in three minutes. Or if you want to take a longer time while you're driving to the, the dance, you can just sing through your songs with that little pursed lip thing. No pressure on my throat. And one of the great things about this little warm-up is when you're in that positive pressure environment, meaning your lips are tightly pursed, you will never hurt yourself. You will never damage your vocal folds. You will. You can sing vigorously. You won't hurt yourself. You can sing quietly. You won't hurt yourself. You open up your mouth, and you might. <laughs> you need, we need more explanation for that. The difference between humming and what I'm suggesting is that when you purse your lips, you can feel a gust of breath on your hands. Try it. Uh, let's sing um, um, Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And the objective is to keep the stream of breath equal from top to bottom. And you can discover that when you tighten up in your throat inadvertently without really being self-aware, the stream of breath will cut off on your hands. It will reduce. And you'll think, oh, my goodness, I've just tightened up my vocal folds, and I never knew that I was doing that. So that little stream of breath provides that extra value, extra monitoring. But the hum has many of the same positive characteristics. Now, are there any... Yes, questions? Could patter calling be considered a warm-up? It can be called a warm-up if you make your breath flow. But one of the challenges with patter calling is that the emphasis is put on the articulation of the words, and you'll find yourself tight in your throat and tight in your mouth with no air flowing, and that reinforces that tight production. But uh, apart from that, yes, it could be useful to you. Are there any other questions? Wayne. Um, drinking. Lemonade. Does that help your vocal cords? The, the answer is a very simple one. You should stay hydrated. But uh, when you feel parched in your mouth and you take a drink, it really does not do anything for your vocal folds immediately. It may take the parched feeling out of your mouth, in which case no problem. But the absolute truth is you don't want water, you don't want lemonade, you don't want coffee, you don't want any liquid down on your vocal folds. Everybody knows what it feels like to swallow down the wrong pipe. And that's what happens when you get liquid down on your vocal folds. So what happens is that you, you take the parched feeling out of your mouth but it has nothing to do with your vocal folds. The vocal folds get their hydration anywhere from 24 to 36 hours earlier than that. The, the fluids just get in your body, so having constantly taking a drink will be good for your vocal folds 12 hours, 24 hours into the future, but it won't do your vocal folds any good right now. And if you allow yourself to become dehydrated, drinking a lot right now will only make you have to pee. It won't help your vocal folds. It has to work through the system. If you do need some hydration on your vocal folds, find steam and, and inhale steam, and that will bring it there. But lemonade tastes good, so why not? Saline nasal spray. Saline nasal spray will help your... It, it will do fine, but you do not want it down on your vocal folds. It will take the dryness out of your nose. It will take the dryness out of your mouth. But the vocal folds are quite another system that receive their moisture, not from the external, but up through the, the whole body system. And so you should be drinking, oh, and anywhere from a half a gallon to a gallon a day, and in great exertion, more than that. And most of us drink a very small fraction of that much liquid. And so most of us are somewhat dehydrated. I've, uh, I've kept you longer than I should. I appreciate your, your uh, patience. One quick question. How long uh, do you stop drinking before you're going to call? I don't think you stop drinking. No, there's, there's no reason to stop because everybody suffers from that parched feeling in your mouth. And when you feel that, that affects you psychologically, whether it affects your vocal folds or not. <laughs> You're all trying to get out. Let's go away. Thank you very much. Thank you.